So it starts with the census tax. That's why it was called Ki Titsa. The Lord said to Moses, when you, oh, Exodus 30, starting at verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, when you take a census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. And we have to keep remembering um, people were forbidden. Even King David was forbidden from counting Israel. And when he did so, even his general warned him, the Lord has forbidden this. But there's two times in the Bible, and this is one of them, where the Lord himself asks that the people be counted. And it was for a purpose. And that's why it talked about um, the ransom, that there be no plague to destroy them. Because when David did count, the plague destroyed all the way through Israel. And that's when he um, bought the threshing floor and built the altar and the Lord stopped the plague getting into Jerusalem. And later on, it was on that threshing floor that Solomon um, or that whole area, Solomon built the temple. Each one who is numbered in the census shall take, shall give this half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel of 20 gera. Half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less. Then the half shekel. You shall give to the Lord's offering to make the atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remember before the Lord, remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. We'll see later on um, after the census, we'll get on to it when Moses returns from the mountain. Um, so remember from 20 years old and up, these were like the fighting men, the people who could protect Israel. Now we get on to the bronze basin, it's called in English, but in Hebrew, Nehoshet, if you remember, the copper, representing judgment. The Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of Nehoshet with its stand of Nehoshet for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn the food offering to the Lord, and they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout the generations. Now the water was to be living water. You'll see um, in a, I can't remember, passage later on, it talks about living water. So they were in the desert, of course. So the only living water in the area were springs. And if you notice the names where God said to camp, they're actually springs. You can go and visit them today, a lot of them. Some of them are lost. We don't know every one that's named. But basically, so of course, living water springs from the ground, not puddles of rain or rivers from old rainwater. These were living springs of water. So the Levites had to bring this water all the time. And as the priests took water out, they wouldn't wash in the basin. They'd take water out to wash their hands and feet. Because if they washed in the basin, you'd have to empty the whole thing out and put more. So they'd take it out to wash hands and feet. So as it was being used, the Levites all the time had to be bringing the water. Now, some like in um, near, near where the model is in Yot Vatar, there's Ainavrona, which is in the middle of the Arava, so they could camp around it. So they had the spring in the middle. But some of them, when you look at the area where they could camp, the springs were on the edge of the mountains. So sometimes it was like um, seven miles to walk to get this water. So these Levites on duty would be constantly like the bucket brigade, I suppose, bringing living water which is very significant because Yeshua said that he would give us springs of living water flowing out of us, this washing of the word. And of course, in John, it's so clear. In the beginning was the word 
and the word was with God and the word was God. And then later on, 14, we see the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Yeshua himself, that word of God is this living water. And that's why it was so important to notice also, I think I mentioned it when we mentioned the menorah, this copper uh, basin also has no measurements notice, no wood being used as a basis, just pure um, copper. It was actually from the mirrors of the women, we'll see later on, pure polish. So it made this like mirror thing. And so later on, what do we also see? You know, God's word is like a mirror. It will show us what we really like. So all these things are very significant. So of course, this living water, and in, in um, I love the woman at the well, John 4, and the Samaritan woman, was it? Yeah, he was in Samaria. And um, she came to draw water. And he said, give me a drink. And she was shocked because here was a Jewish man asking a Samaritan woman, who the Jews considered unclean half-breeds, for water. And like you, what you're asking me? And, and Yeshua um, said, well, you know, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask him and he would give you springs of living water. And she's like, oh, oh, give me that so I don't have to come here anymore. She totally misunderstood it at the beginning. But there he was really saying, you know, he's the Lord of the universe. He's the one that the water, the word that spoke, he's the one that, that was the one that actually created everything in the first place. He's the fountain, the springhead of everything. The fountain of life and water brings life without water we can't live uh, you know we can live maybe three days we can live 40 days without food or so but not without water so here's so significant no limits on the word of God there are no limits on his word and um, it is our spring of living water there's so much more to to speak about but this is quite a big passage today um, so I just pray as you meditate on it and go through all these scriptures, um, you'll notice also when Yeshua at the last supper washed the disciples feet, he was also washing with the water of the word. He was commissioning the kingdom priesthood. So very significant because the priests had to use this living water to wash their hands and feet before doing the sacrificing and before going in to serve the Lord. So in the mirror, of course, James, that's the other analogy in the, in the New Testament. The anointing oil and incense. The Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and the sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250, and 250 of the aromatic cane, and 500 of cassa, according to the shekel of the sanctuary and a hin of olive oil, and you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its utensils. Excuse me. Hmm. And the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand, you shall consecrate them and they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall not make any other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on his own outer, out, on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, steche, onecha, and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each there shall be an equal part, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, 
where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make, according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use as a perfume shall be cut off from his people. This is very special um, mix. As I say, there's uh, two sources they're not quite sure of for the incense. And I've met women who would come and say they make the holy incense. And I was like, I'm still a bit shocked internally because God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And if he said, don't make any the same, exactly the same for you, I still, even as believers, don't think we should be doing it. It's, it's, very, it's special for the Lord. It's his incense for his purpose. Now, if he, you know, I really, you know, oh, I mean, I tell you, in, in heaven, in his, in his absolute presence, you know, we will be anointed with this oil, this incense, but he will do it. It's his. And I think it was very, very special. Um, also, very strong. Now, we I don't mind using parts of it. We used to burn myrrh and frankincense together in the incense altar in the Holy of Holies until we get some modern people who are allergic to scent. So we had to stop, which was a pity because, boy, did it give such an atmosphere. It wasn't, you know, we didn't feel that we could make the exact same, even though it's a replica. It's, you know, but enough to get the essence. <laughs> But it was so powerful. You could smell it in the courtyard. You could smell it as you were even coming up to the entrance of the courtyard and the holy place. Amazingly powerful. And so it's also related in Revelation with the prayers of the saints, the special sweet-smelling incense. We've talked about it before, the prayers of the saints that go up before the Lord. And, of course, when you look at the practical side, as I said, God is always practical. You have all the slaughtering of these animals, and of course the priests slaughtered their sacrifices in the courtyard. But when you get um, uh, in the desert, especially with heat and slaughtered animals and blood, what do you have? Tons of, millions of. Zuvim, <laughs> <laughs> flies. So of course, wow, can you imagine, you know, trying to swat all these flies? They didn't have to. It didn't occur to me until I was talking to someone um, about the analogy of our prayers, you know, um, against Satan and his influence coming in. And he's called Baal Zavuv, the Lord of the Flies, you know. And we were talking and we ended up laughing because we realized, my goodness, they would have kept, this incense would have kept flies away. And it wasn't until I heard from a religious guy who came that said, oh, guess what they've found in the New Jerusalem dig under the um, Temple Mount before they were ordered to close it all. Um, they found some real um, cakes of this incense from ancient times. So they took it and took a tiny piece and gave it to a Noan Cohen in the lineage. And he took it away in this tiny piece. He burnt it to test how, it, you know, Test. And he reported back from the area where he tested it, just one tiny piece, for two whole weeks, not a single fly or insect came near the place. And we were just, my goodness, talk about awe and shock. We were like, wow, this means there were no flies around the altar outside. There were no flies where they were sacrificing. This incense kept the flies away. So if we will praise and worship and bring our incense and our, our worship to the Lord, Satan can't stay. He has to flee, you know. Submit yourself to the Lord. <laughs> Resist the devil and he will. It's, you know, it's so emphatic. He must. He has no choice. So here's this beautiful analogy. So it's this incense and anointing oil is so very special to the Lord. Very special. And um, 
there's a lot more about that as well. I mean, Yeshua, I mean, <laughs> he's the one that ever intercedes for us. So again, I mean, every single aspect, he's the water that washes us. He's the blood that's poured out, the sacrifice given to um, pay for us. He's the incense that anoints us and, and keep, you know, oh, there's just so much. Now we come on to chapter 31 on a Aholiav and Bitzalel. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have called by name Bitzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now, if you know Hebrew, Bitzalel literally means in the shadow of God. And of course, um, when the Bible talks about man being created in his image, it's Bitzalem. Bethlehem Adonai, so in the image of God, in the shadow of God, so Bethel's, Bethel's name, we talked about names last week, I think, the names in the Bible, I mean, how did his parents know? Obviously, the Lord leads parents to name their children, because Bethel's, um inheritance from the Lord, or, or you know, preordained gifting that he was giving, was exactly what's going to happen now, in that he is the first one in the Bible where I have put my spirit upon him. You know, later on, David knew when the spirit came upon him. But this is the first one we'll see as we read on, listed where God had put his spirit upon him. And I have filled him, here it is, filled, not upon, but even filled with, with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs and to work in gold silver and copper in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft and behold i have appointed with him a holiav the son of asimach of the tribe of dan now the interesting thing is again names mean something a holiav literally means in the tent of father ochel tent of father <laughs> you don't get named for nothing in the Bible. You don't get named for nothing anyway, you know. Name, all of our names mean something. And you'll find your given name, you'll find that within it is, it is the gifting that God has given. Sometimes we have to search for it, but it's there. So in the shadow of God and in the tent of the Father, we're given the jobs of being in charge of building the tent. They weren't the only ones, we'll see. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and the utensils and the pure lampstand with all the utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand and the finely worked garments and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded you they shall do so um, they were in charge of this and it's really interesting nothing was Moses was shown you'll notice those four times as I showed you he obviously described and talked to it, to the workmen that God had told him. I've even chosen the workmen. But it was the Holy Spirit who designed all those details, you know. He gave, gave Aholiav, or, or Batsalel, all the talent for designing the crown and the cherubim and everything. So who's to know? I mean, I can't say, but who's to know that even the Holy Spirit showed him visions of the cherubim and things like this, because it was under the Holy Spirit's um, direction that everything in detail was built. And basically, you know, look at our standing today. The Holy Spirit has come and filled us because of what Yeshua said. You know, it's to your advantage that I go because I can send the Comforter. And we see in Acts that he came and was like flames of, of fire. But he now lives within us. So as we learn that relationship, and I've been reading um, also in Luke again because we're in the end of days, and Yeshua himself warns us, um, stay alert. You know, stay alert. 
And that means listening to the Holy Spirit, uh, reading the word and allowing the Holy Spirit to just well, bring it to life within us and really teach us. He is our teacher because that's Yeshua directly said, he will take my words and he will explain them. He will teach them to you. So we have the most amazing thing. We have the God who wrote the Bible, actually, you know, dictated the Bible to us. So we actually have the author to explain it to us. I mean, what book on earth does anyone get where you have the author with you all the time that if you don't understand something, you can directly ask him <laughs> and wait. You know, sometimes you need to learn a bit more before you can even understand. I used to tell people you cannot give a university thesis to a three-year-old. He'll screw it up, chew on it, and, and rip it up. He won't understand a thing. But once he's been to school and learned science and arithmetic and language and this and that and that, step by step by step, he's learning these things. Then when you give him the thesis, when he's at the right level, boom, he understands everything and the progression of it. So don't we see it ourselves? We can have the same verse that we've read 10 times and each time we see another amazing truth. It was always there, always there. And it's like, why didn't I see this before? But unless we've got to the point in our understanding and our walk with the Lord, it goes right over our head. We cannot understand it. So we've got to keep going. And so that's why rereading and rereading the Bible is so exciting because next time round, God adds the next truth and the next truth. And it blows me away by the time you get to the 10th, 11th, whatever time, how deep one little verse can be or one passage. It's like, wow. Every aspect that he teaches you on the journey is so true. And so by the time you've done it all these times, you're like, my goodness, it is so deep. And I tell you, there's so much in here. We will never learn it all until we get there. <laughs> you know? But that's how exciting God's word is. Okay. So that's another encouragement to us is that don't... Um, despise the giftings God gives you. In fact, I realize that he gives the giftings, but we must be willing to work on them with him, like the giftings are there. But so if we're a gifted artist, you know, you, as a kid, you're scribbling away and whatever. But then as we grow up, we're practicing and we're getting better and better until, you know, the whole door opens up. The same with God's word, discerning God's word, whatever gift God gives you, you can't sit back and just let it happen. We have to be involved in doing and learning and, and improving our skill. It's not that, that we're earning it. It's that we are fine-tuning with the Lord's help, the skill and the, and the gifting and the calling that he's put there. So it's not just a, a passive thing. We need to be actively involved in the calling that God has on our lives. So that's an encouragement. Like he chose the men, but they had to get actively involved. Now we get to Shabbat. <laughs> We've already talked a lot about this, but it, it is exciting. Oh, but I tell you, the Lord's just shown me something recently about Shabbat. It's like, oh. So, and the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Shabbat, for this is a sign, we talked about this, between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall you work, shall your work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel 
in that in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. He gave, he, he, and he gave to Moses. Oh, no, we'll finish that later. We'll get on to that last verse. So notice it's a forever thing and related, of course, to creation. And we talked about this, that, you know, man was created on the end of the sixth day. So his first day on earth was Shabbat. And you'll notice even in the Hebrew language, you've got Yom Rishon, Yom Shani, you know, one, two, day, one, day, two, day, three. That's how they're actually called legally. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. Um, but Shabbat's not called <laughs> Yom Shvi. It is Shabbat. It even has a different name. It, does, it doesn't even have a number as a name. Or nor does it have a symbol as a name, because you know, Aleph Bet Gimel Dalit Hey, it, it is written Shabbat because that's its name and it's very special. And a sign, you'll notice, I think we talked about it last week about the um, Sinai covenant was a marriage covenant. And um, I've been reading Joel Richardson's book about um, the um, Sinai covenant. And he points all the aspects that point to how God um, courted Israel, like wooed them and, and showed them his power in Egypt and then brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand, rescued, you know, who doesn't want, I mean, ladies understand it more than guys, maybe, maybe the guys understand being the knight on the shining armor with the shine on a white horse but every every little girl notice princess she wants to be rescued by a knight and shining armor on a horse and so god did he turned up in egypt boom and with 10 big mighty things he busted them out and rescued them from their uh, slave owners who cruelly used them and he took them out then of course they go through all this ah, no they're following us we're gonna die we're gonna die so then he starts showing them mercy and showing, hey, hey, just hang on a minute. Let me, you know, show you a thing or two today, you know. And so, of course, he says, these Egyptians that you see now, you'll never see them again. So here he is wooing his, his he, you know, his love, life, you know, his love out of slavery, take, busting them out of slavery, brings them to where, you know, the slave owners are following, and he basically knocks off the competition. <laughs> he wipes them out so that there's no one else vying for his bride. He wipes, literally <laughs> knocks them off, kills the com competition. And then he shows them that he can provide everything. Water from a rock. Who's ever heard of a thing that a rock in the desert can split open and pour out tons of water? He can later on manna from heaven, quails. I mean, he just spends his time loving on these people that are scared, stiff, and complaining, and just saying, Hey, I can do anything for you. I love you, you know. So you'll see all this covenant stuff now when it gets to Shabbat as a sign. In a way, it's like I know in our modern times, the sign, we all know what the sign of marriage is, is the ring. So God's sign with Israel is Shabbat. It's his wedding ring, his engagement ring, his wedding ring. All of, you know, it is the sign that he is committed to them forever. Okay. And of course, um, any good marriage, I mean, I'm only speaking from what I know to be true, but not from experience, because I never ever got married. So, but I know. That the wisest thing any marriage married couple can do is make themselves even when because I did a lot of um, I did a lot of child minding for married couples that was my tough kid as a young teenager and my joy was to walk in and just take over the family so the um, my friends husband and wife could go off either for a night or a week or whatever and just leave everything and go off and have a um, date night or a date weekend. So basically, God set a weekly date with his bride. Now, man, if everyone would understand that that's part of Shabbat, you would put everything else aside. Who cares? I mean, yes, 
I want to go on a date with my love, you know, that's, that's God putting, and you see, Yeshua said, I am the Lord of Shabbat. And of course, it's not that, you know, man has made a set of rules. You know, I, I used to go keep Shabbat in New Zealand by going to the synagogue and sitting with the ladies. And of course, one of the first things I learned, because they, they had really interesting things that they said about, and because it was in New Zealand, it's in English. I mean, they read in Hebrew, but then the talk was in English, so I could understand it. And I'd be there with my little note paper writing away, and the lady saw me once. Oh, no, you can't even write on Shabbat. And I'm like, seriously? It's like the Pharisees when the when they were walking through the fields together, the Lord of Shabbat with his disciples hanging out together, which was date day, you know, let's hang out together, just being together. And they reached out, picked some corn to eat it. Oh, what are you doing working on Shabbat? And Yeshua said, what? Mapitom. I can I can just imagine them turning around like the Israelis do when, when you do something and they're like, Mapitom, what do you mean? <laughs> That's ridiculous. You know, you know, it's this is just it's not work. I mean, seriously, you do not abandon your animals on Shabbat. If you're a farmer, you don't hang out at home. You first of all go and make sure your animals have food and water for the day and that they are resting somewhere, but you still make sure they have food and water. That's not work as a you know as such picking a piece of corn to eat when you're with the master it's not work but we've made so many rules around it that it becomes a big weight and a problem and you see Paul was saying don't let anybody judge you on Shabbats and high holidays and things and he was talking also to the Gentiles at that stage who'd grown up with pagan stuff and this is where I believe that that people have got it wrong I wrote a really strong piece. I actually took it off the website because, of course, you know how it upsets people. God wrote everything in stone. It's written in stone even, you know. The fourth commandment after the three about himself, about who he is and keeping, is the fourth commandment. He did not keep all the other commandments and say, oh, well, you know, Shabbat doesn't matter so much. You can change it. You know, he warned us that someone would come along and try and change the seasons. It was actually done. I know you sure was raised on the first day of the week, but that was no reason for changing Shabbat. He never said change Shabbat. It's just, yes, he, he rose after Motse Shabbat. After Shabbat went out, he rose again. So it was, Paul talked about... Um, um this at the time when Sh the lord's day was shabbat and still is shabbat you know so it's just that the people who changed the time they really were their purpose behind it was was um trying to cut off um the supposed christian church in those days from its jewish roots and i really believe god's bringing the the true church the true believers back to their roots that's why i do believe in keeping Shabbat, but as I said, uh, you know, Shabbat is Shabbat, but I'll still go to church with my family when I'm home, and any excuse to worship and follow the Lord, <laughs> but it's, you know, Shabbat will always be Shabbat, there's, you know, it's, it's God has set it, and notice it's always forever, 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 and so, you know, there again, you know, the Torah is, is God's loving instructions on how to deal with him. I mean, can you imagine? This is his loving instruction to have a date with him once a week and hang out. Hang out with the one who created us and loves us. So it is, and it is literally set in stone somewhere. Somewhere God has the rewritten tablets, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, the golden calf. Uh oh. Now, you know, they all gave the, the so you, part of the marriage thing is that, you know, when you get married, the woman goes to do mikveh, this washing. So the same thing. Um, God told Moses to tell them to wash for three days and prepare. So they turn up at the base of the mountain after three days. They've done their mikveh. Then the bridegroom turns up on the mountain, boom, with all the fanfare and lights and whatever, because in a marriage, um, the husband turns up with all the shofarim, you know, boop, boop. and he even provided the canopy 
because the pillar of cloud, you know, covered the whole of the camp. So he provided the canopy. He turns up and um, speaks. Now he's reading, if you know anything about the Hebrew weddings, there's a ketubah, the written like provision of what the husband will provide and what the joint responsibilities are. You know, we each agree, you know, and actually <laughs> the father agrees on behalf, the father of the bride agrees, agrees on her behalf that she will do these things, you know. So I suppose maybe Moses was the father. I don't know. <laughs> I won't go too far in that way. But basically, here's God is reading the Ketubah. They hear him. They're terrified because, you know, but he's basically reading out the Ketubah. And later on, and this is the verse after, you know, um, we talk about Shabbat, verse 18. And he gave Moses, when, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So here's the written ketubah that God read to the people. So it follows all the, the, the um, procedure of a, of a wedding. So the stone tablets are very much involved in, I mean, God's very romantic and very loving. And I mean, so here's the Ketubah written. Now, six weeks later, we'll read here. We're going to go on to the golden calf, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed, because God called him up there and there was no mention of time, but that made this covenant and Aaron was there and Aaron was instructed to look after them. We'll see what happens. Delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up and make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, notice they're already saying, the man. What happened to God who did all the amazing stuff? You know, the, there's talk about, you know, Satan in the garden. Did God really say you know, this is Satan's ploy. He always, you know, slightly changes things. So they'd forgotten that God was the one that did all the um, bringing out. They just blamed it on a man now. Uh, out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Basically, they're saying he's probably dead. You know, he's been up there with no food and water for 40 days, you know, six weeks. So Aaron said to them, now here's Aaron who had come and spent time with Moses. He was the spokesperson. God said he'll speak to Moses, but um, he actually wanted Moses to speak, but because of Moses, uh, I can't. God finally said, okay, I'll speak through you, and Aaron can do the actual talking, but I speak to you, you tell Aaron. So Aaron has heard already everything that God has told Moses because Aaron had to speak it out to the people. So he's, and he's been there and seen all these wonders. So has, he never says, hang on a minute, you know, let's, um, you know, look what God's done for us. None of that. He didn't take his responsibility. He just said, oh, okay. He said to them, take off your rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be the feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay. Now, this is not just rose up to play. These are these drunken, um, idealistic orgies, very much involved in, in like sexual orgies. I mean, terrible stuff, really terrible stuff now it's interesting in the real mount sinai you'll see an obsidian stepped altar with all these calves and gods engraved on it which is a pagan altar and of course the golden calf would have been on top and that's why they're saying these are the gods that brought you out of egypt because they had carved these multi-gods into this altar so it was definitely pagan worship um and aaron was very complicit complicit in it and um 
And so notice it clearly says that he made it with an engraving tool. Remember that, that he made it with an engraving tool. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. Notice what God's doing now. He's telling Moses, go down to your people, not mine, you know, who you brought. He's just repeating what the gods, you know, they've missed God out. So he's just saying, okay, go down and see your people who you brought. They have corrupted themselves and have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. OK, well, first of all, we'll cover 40 days, six weeks later, Israel divorced God. Unilaterally, they just divorced him, left their covenant with him and went and followed foreign gods six weeks i mean six weeks i'm sure some people on earth humans do it but you know how how fickle how easily changeable is our heart if we don't have you know the lord is trying to teach us patience and that's why you'll see all the feasts of the lord not the israel you know not of israel but these are the feasts of the lord which means they do apply to us too all these feasts. And, and I really believe when Paul was saying, don't let anyone judge you on the Shabbat and the feasts, he was speaking to Gentiles. So they were being judged because they were following supposedly Jewish feasts and, and Shabbat. But he says, don't let them judge you on that. And that's why I encourage you, Steve, and these others who people come against you because you're a Shabbat keeper. Don't let them judge you on it. Paul says so, you know, don't let people um, judge you on these things. Follow what the Lord has said, you know, the feasts of the Lord. And, of course, they were remembrance feasts because God knows us how quickly we forget. So he has all these regular feasts. So remember this, remember that, even the communion. As often as you do it, do it to remember me. We can do it however many times a day if we need to. And I really believe, you know, when you're praying for the sick, Communion is one of the most powerful times to pray for the sick, and you can do it, and you don't have to be an ordained priest either. It's, you know, it is given to each one of us who believe, even if it's with ourselves. Sometimes I have communion with myself to remember because there's a specific thing I'm praying for, and even sometimes just because, hey, you know, I've even gone down to the Aroma Coffee House and invited God out for coffee. <laughs> And I think it's one of the most marvelous things to do. Have a little communion with you or your husband and family, whatever, however many people were there, even if with yourself. And I recommend, you know, even if you're on your own, invite the Lord for coffee and just spend the time together, you know. He's, he's a practical God and he really wants to develop that closeness of relationship. So especially, I believe, for deliverance, uh, oh, I have seen some powerful testimony from a New Zealand couple who always use communion for deliverance. And it shakes up. If nothing, you know, people have prayed and fasted and, and, and are praying and these demons won't move. You have communion. If the person agrees to have communion, man, they are out of there. They cannot, they cannot, they cannot tolerate the blood of Jesus because of uh, it, it, nothing, nothing can stand before the blood of Jesus, not, not anybody, not a demon, nothing. So sometimes communion can be the key for breaking the power of oppression and um, possession, whatever. Um, don't underestimate it. In fact, you know, prayerfully, you know, it, it, it's one of the greatest tools but not just it's not just a tool it's it's developing that depth of relationship with with our messiah who's paid this deep price and so until he comes so in the meantime you know and and like the why didn't the disciples fast well when the bridegroom's with them who's going to be fasting you're feasting 
But he said the time will come when the bridegroom will go away and they'll be fasting. And we're still in that time. We are, we are remembering, we're fasting, remembering until he comes. Very powerful tool. And so they were doing this very pagan, pagan thing. Now look at this. God has said, okay, that's it. I'll start again with you. I've had enough. You know, they broke basically, you know, they've divorced him after agreeing with the strong covenant and all the things he did for them. Amazing stuff. But Moses, obviously, look, he's developed this relationship with the Lord. He knows God's heart. He knows all the promises that God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Yaakov. And he, he knows God's heart. Later on, Daniel also, you'll see these prophets who know God's heart. They put themselves um, in the forefront of their people and they've done nothing wrong, but they put themselves there. We, they put themselves with the people. Now look at Moses. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people who you brought out of the land of Egypt? He's going back and, and telling what really happened. And with great power and with a mighty hand, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember... There he is, because God's already said, remember. So I think God is just, I mean, God knew. It's a test in a way for Moses, because anyone with a big ego would have said, oh, yeah, like like Noah, of course, you know, I'll be, you know, and I'll make sure my sons follow you sort of thing. No way. Moses was meek and humble, because then he starts speaking God's word back to him in a way. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they will inherit it forever. Okay, so look, God did make a unilateral covenant with Abraham. Abraham cut the pieces you know, to make the covenant. And usually they both walk through and say, so this cutting and destruction will happen to me if I ever break this covenant. But God put Abraham to sleep. So God took on both sides of the covenant, Abraham and himself, and did a unilateral covenant with Israel to give them the land. And here is Moses. He's reminding God, which I think just really pleased God because he wants us to you know notice when he went talked about shabbat it's holy for you well it's holy for the lord too so here's this he wants us to remind him not that he's forgotten but it means that it, we are remembering as well it's for both of us so as we remind him of these things we are reminding ourselves yes he promised, he did it. He did this, 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 and this. And notice that David was very good at this, you know, especially Psalm, is it 42 and 43? Why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your trust in God. I will yet praise the Lord. So he was doing the same thing in going back. And you'll notice so many of his Psalms, oh, I'm all done in, I'm at the end of my life, that's it, you know, things are miserable, blah, 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 blah. and then he starts saying, but God did this and remember that. So by the end of the psalm, he's like, yes, I'm carrying on, God is great, you know, because you'll see his heart. He starts bringing in the remembrance of what God has done. And, and don't you find the same thing, you know? I, there's where the incense helps me in that when we're really down, and I remember times of struggling through mud, struggling against thoughts and things that are coming in, and I can't deal with it. And I learned early on to stick on praise music, and out of duty you'll start singing, you know, bah, 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 bah. and you'll start singing and then notice as you start singing and singing and singing, the, the music is helping you. And then by the end of it, boof, it's like the heavens blew open and you're right and Satan's just run away. And I used to give that illustration for praise and worship at the incense altar. As we continue to persevere in praise and worship, the time will come 
every single time where boof you know when satan disappeared and his minions or whatever because suddenly it's like the heavens open and the worship is just and you don't want to leave it's just touched your heart and and just busted open the heavens so really we have these wonderful blessed tools okay and the lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken on bringing on his people he responded like he did to daniel and the others it really pleases god when we come in this way and then moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand tablets that were written on both sides on the front and on the back they were written the tablets were the words of work of god and the writing was the writing of god engraved on the tablets when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, because he'd waited sort of halfway up for Moses, he wasn't down with them. He said, there's noise of war in the camp. But then he said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but a sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses's anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. So there... Anyway, the covenant was broken. And so here's the um, physical outworking of the covenant is broken. It's null and void. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it into powder, scattered it on all the water, on the water, and made the people of Israel drink it. So here we have this, that they, uh, you know, the only water source is now with this um, broken up, idol that that is false and they have to drink which means what's going to happen is that they're drinking their idol and what happens to to stuff you drink okay the body absorbed the water but all the dust and the gold and whatever gets excuse me for the word pooped out it's a bit like what god did to the egyptians to show their gods were nothing he, you know, just, just, you know, the god, the god of, uh, that was the frog lady, who, who was the one that her husband made wooden babies, and and she blessed them and put them in the womb, and that's how people got babies in Egypt. That was their funny belief. So of course he sends so many frogs that they don't want to disturb her because they want to keep having babies. So they're living with these blippy, slimy things in their house. Yeah, yeah, please take them away, take them away. So what does God do? Kills them all. They all die. So finally, these people have to scrape themselves out of their own house with forks and slimy, stinky, absolutely disgustingly stinky um, bodies of their God that they so respected. So in a way, what was uh, Moses doing was making them poop out their God that they, you know, it was nothing to show. It was nothing. I mean, very graphic, but. Ugh. And Moses and Aaron, Moses said to Aaron, now listen to this. The one who was in charge, who had been with Moses, who had seen all these things, who should have been looking after the people and encouraging them to stay focused on the Lord. What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, well, let your not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they're set on evil. <laughs> and they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and listen to this. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. I mean, it's so, such a insane excuse. Moses doesn't, doesn't even address it. I mean, anybody in their right minds knows it's not true. But, you know, goodness me. I mean, I used to wonder why mum and dad always knew when I wasn't telling the truth because I was so sure as a little kid I'd done it so surreptitiously, whatever, that nobody would ever know. But as an adult when you see kids and, and, and deal with them, <laughs> you know, they're so convinced that they're telling, you know, that they're telling you that you're convinced they're telling the truth. 
but it is so laughable. I remember, you know, being very careful, trying not to laugh at some kids I was looking after because they're, it's true, you know, it's true and this and this and this and this. And it was so obvious. It was like, but it's not good to laugh at them either. I mean, they need to be disciplined, not laughed at. But can you imagine? I mean, now I understand um, why my parents knew. I mean, it's so obvious as an adult when you're looking. So it's so obvious that this was an out and out right lie. So he didn't even address it. But when he saw that the people had broken loose and that's getting into these orgies for Aaron had let them break loose for the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp. Notice he didn't even go in. He stood at the gate and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi, which was his tribe, gathered around him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, put the sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion with his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that, that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow blessing upon you this day. So you'll notice later on also God confirms this, that the Levites, Levite men, are now set aside to serve the Lord instead of the firstborn of Israel. You'll see that, um, uh, you know, for each, uh, or have we covered that? Anyway, so this is where they now take on the service for the Lord instead of the firstborn. And, of course, 3,000 on, on that day, the giving of the law. Now, Pentecost is... is um, what we call the giving of the law today. That's when they, in the synagogue, celebrate it, and we celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So notice, isn't it interesting, these cameos? Here's about 3,000 were killed on that day because of their disobedience. Notice what happens when the disciples, Peter and the disciples, are preaching on that day of Pentecost. About how many came to the Lord? So you'll see there's a, there's a direct correlation. There's no coincidences in God's word. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin, and they have made for themselves gods of gold. And now if you will forgive their sin, if not, please block me out here's the same attitude like daniel me take me instead even paul if only i could die instead of my people you know the same heart block me out of your book that you have written but the lord said to moses whoever has sinned against me i will blot out of my book but now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in that day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And then the Lord sent a plague upon the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. So we get on to chapter 33, the command to leave Sinai. The Lord said to Moses, depart up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Yaakov, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments, for the Lord had said to Moses, Say to this people Israel, you are stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments, from Mount Horeb onwards. So we'll see later on um, Moses' response to that. But now we have the tent of meeting. This is where there's quite a bit of confusion with even the religious Jews as well. They haven't thought it through. 
the tent of meeting, Oala Moed. Now, the first Oala Moed mentioned is this one, which is Moses' tent. So notice Moses used to take the tent, so this is his, this tent, and pitch it outside of the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting, the Oala Moed. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Wherever Moses went out to the tent, or whenever, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his own tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. That's all it says. But can you imagine he went up with Moses and waited before God called him up called Moses to the uh, cloud but Joshua just waited outside all those days as well and every time Moses went back Joshua stayed in the tent um, you know the time that he spent you know it's a picture for us the time we spend with the Lord just quietly Moses intercession so you see this was and later on he put the um, in a box the second copy of the tablets in the tent, the Olamoed, outside of the camp. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight consider too that this nation is your people and he said my presence will go with you and i will give you rest and he said of him if your presence will not go with me do not bring us up from here so this is god moses response to god saying i won't go i'll send you my angel he's like if you don't come with us we're not going i, won't, I don't want to move without you and so you know, how long are we waiting on the Lord and we try and move without him where God wants us to wait until we get to the point, look, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, I'm not making one step until I know that you're with me, that I'm following you instead of running off and being busy, busy, boy, I tell you, <laughs> busy, busy, busy doing everything that sounds as though you're doing it from the Lord, but it's not what he's asked you to do. I've learned that lesson time and time again, and I know it's one I have to keep learning. You know, don't rush ahead of God. You know, don't move until you know that he's moving and wants you to move with him. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of this earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. See there, he knows him by name. So here's this, it, God really wanted Moses to respond like this. And, and he wants us to respond like this to him. It's not being um, presumptuous, if you get what I mean. It's, it's when you've got to the place of understanding God's ways. And we've seen, so the Bible is so clear, showing us his ways are, he will test us to see where we're up to. You know, have we learned that lesson? And once we've learned, we move on to the next. Um, because if you try and like and run ahead and lose lessons, then you'll never get that full understanding. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. 
And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So isn't this interesting? His glory, his name, but he couldn't see him face to face. Now, what's the difference between this time and the time when, as part of the covenant, they had a covenant meal, marriage covenant meal, Aaron and his sons, the elders of Israel, and they saw God face to face and God didn't break up out against them. So we've already talked about that in that when it talks about seeing God face to face or the angel of the Lord, it's actually Yeshua that they meet face to face. Because yes, he was born in a moment in time and lived and died in time, but he's eternal, which means that they call them Christophanies. There's several times in the Bible where people meet the Messiah in person, in the flesh, um, supposedly before he's born, but God is outside of time. So this that was one of the times, whereas now, this is one of the times when the Almighty, the Father, is passing by. And so he cannot look and live, so he can just see his back. But that's the difference. I mean, it can be awfully confusing in a lot of ways, but you really need to meditate, and the Holy Spirit will show you these times. Moses makes new tablets. Now, notice God provided the, the material and the writing the first time. Now, he asks Moses to bring his own tablets. So the Lord said, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets. So Moses didn't write. Some people say he wrote on the second. He didn't. God rewrote, but Moses had to provide the material, which you broke. Be ready by morning and come up to the mount to, in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite the mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. He rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord a God of mercy and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but those who will by no means clear but who by no means will clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped and said, Now if I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and make for us your inheritance. Now God's renewing his covenant and so it carries on and said, Behold, I'm making a covenant before all the people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are, you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do for you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat his sacrifice, and you take their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods, you shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. You shall keep the feast of the unleavened bread. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. At the time appointed in the ninth month of Aviv, for the month Aviv, you came out of Egypt. All that open the womb are mine. All 
your males, livestock, firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb, or you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall, not, shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days shall you work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In ploughing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feasts of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year you shall all make your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall cover covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Again, notice, 40 days and 40 nights. This time the people, praise the Lord, did not go back to an idol. He neither ate nor bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Well, it was God who wrote it, but you'll see Moses also, he wrote on scrolls that were kept on one end of the um, Ark of the Testimony, but it was God, clearly it said, and it's true, that God wrote the words on the second tablets. The shining face of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, amazing guy, really, when you think of it, 40 days with no food and water, comes down finds what the people have done, breaks the covenant, um, deals with the situation in, in making them um, drink their God and, and dealing with um, cutting off probably the ones that were still reveling that hadn't calmed down. Those were probably the 3,000 that were killed. Dealing with the situation and going to God to pray. And then he went up for another 40 days, another six weeks. Without, I mean, it's God's sustaining power, of course, as well. He came down with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. As he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. You can always tell when people have been with the Lord because the Holy Spirit just shines out of them. It's Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron, and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterwards, all the people of God came near and of Israel came near, and he commanded them all the Lord had spoken with them in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. When Enabur, Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Capital H. Amazing. So I've often thought of like, um, because he spoke to him face to face, this guy was speaking to Yeshua face to face so often, you know, and we have the Holy Spirit within us. So we have that personal relationship all the time, but still don't you long to really like panim al panim, face to face, look on his face. One day we will, one day we will. But so in the meantime, spending time with him to get to know his personality, his ways, his, his likes, his dislikes, it's so much easier than reading a set of rules, you know, the set of rules as to speak, what, you know, all the things that Moses writes down in Leviticus and whatever, because really the, Torah, the uh, covenant, the stone tablets, was the ketubah, the, the, the love covenant between 
the people and, and Christ has given us our love covenant, you know, sealed there again, the Holy Spirit is that seal, the deposit, the down deposit, the like when you go into a shop, I don't know how you, you put this deposit on, nobody else can take that item, it's yours and you come back and you redeem it. So at the moment we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and that's why it talks, well, why he says in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head for your redemption draws near. He's already our savior. We've been saved, but he is turning up in person to redeem us, you know, your mind. I remember as kids, we used to have on, on Sunday morning, these um, children's stories and I remember one about this I'm not very good at Scottish accents my brother was the imitator we are from Scottish background as well as Welsh um, London London were a Londoner is my granddad Welsh my grandma and my maternal grandparents are from Scotland <laughs> so anyway there was this um, story of this little boy who carved spent a lot of time carving this little boat and painting it and everything. And he was playing with it by the sea and a wind came along and took it away and he lost his boat years and years later. Excuse me if I cry a bit because this was one of my favorite stories because it reminded me of God, you know, and that's the whole point of the story. And years later, somewhere along the line, this fisherman had, had fished out this boat that was all cracked and, and the paint had come off and whatever. And he took it and, and sold it at a pawn shop. And this now much older boy, young man came past and saw the boat and recognized it because he built it. And he took it out and he went and paid the price to buy it back. And he's holding this boat and he says, you're twice mine. I built you and I bought you back. That's our saviour. That's our redeemer. Look up because he's coming back. And wow, I tell you, this is a love story. This is a manufacturer's manual and just so much love poured out in spite of our disobedience, in spite of our falling on our face so many times. He just wants to pick us up. And he says, like to David, strengthen those hands that are shaking, those knees that are shaking. I, I will discipline you. You know, I will teach you and I will discipline you. But the discipline is to bring in love, not wrath. We're not experiencing the wrath of God. We're experiencing his, you know, whack on the butt. For, you know, no, this is this is not the way to do it. And sometimes, I mean, I had to learn recently. I don't know if you understand the Israeli way. And, of course, without the language, I got myself into a situation where this lady was talking me into getting some sort of insurance and I was like no 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 and anyway finally they I was praying about it anyway I worked it all out but the thing is that this guy got so upset he says oh you know we have to charge you and I said fine it's my fault it's my fault for not asking um the lord you know but <laughs> basically I didn't I was so much doing so many other things that I didn't stop to think with everything going on and it was like the Lord said, you know, I've told you time and time again, make no decisions, make no decisions, do not do anything until you, you know, I say this, this and this way and this way. And so I knew the Lord was saying, you know, you need to, you know, have a physical cost for learning this lesson because you didn't learn it the first time. So I had to pay this guy quite a bit of money. Um, and I told him, yes, I deserve it. But by all this hole in your name, it made me look at another area that I hadn't realized. So, you know, it was the Lord helping me deal with financial matters, but um, it cost. And, and sometimes even now, you know, we have to learn, you know, dad always said, if you don't learn by precept, you'll learn by the seat of your pants. So, you know, God is so gracious. So that's this week. Ooh, more exciting stuff to come. <laughs>